I'm back in the coronavirus sequencing lab because there's a new variant in the news. The question is, should we be worried? I'm recording this on the 26th of November 2021 and talking about the catchily named B11529 variant. But lots of lessons from trying to make sense of the early data about this new viral strain will apply to making sense of any new flavour of COVID. Also, it's looking like B11529 will be named the new variant by the WHO, after new, the 13th letter of the Greek alphabet. And that also means I can call it the new variant, which sounds exactly like the new variant. Hi, Andrew from the future here, uh, about two hours into the future actually. I'm doing the edit and I've just found out that the WHO aren't going to call this the new variant. They're going to call it the Omicron variant. So that time when you have to imagine that I'm talking about the new variant, um, well I'm afraid that's now. And there are a few times in the video when I talk about new, so if you could just imagine that I said Omicron. I guess this is one of the hazards of trying to keep up with the latest news on Covid. Even two years in, it's still moving incredibly fast. Sorry about that. There are three main things we want to know about a new coronavirus variant. Firstly, how transmissible is it? Does it spread from person to person faster than other coronavirus variants? Second, can it evade our immune defences and infect people who've been vaccinated or reinfect people who've already had the disease? And finally, does it make people sicker, put more people in hospital? And ultimately, is it more deadly than other variants of coronavirus? These are hard questions to answer when a new variant has only just appeared on the scene. But there are also significant dangers to just waiting and seeing when it comes to infectious diseases, as we've all seen in the last couple of years. So let's give understanding this variant our best shot. The way we identify a new coronavirus variant is by its RNA sequence, the biological recipe that makes a coronavirus behave in the way that it does. We get these sequences because countries around the world are collecting them. Some of the COVID swabs that test positive will be sent on to be fully sequenced, and these sequences are then analysed by scientists. If one differs substantially from all the other known coronavirus sequences, and then, even worse, if it starts appearing in databases of these sequences more and more frequently, it might be time to take a closer look. And that's exactly what happened with B11529. More than two-thirds of the sequences collected in the South African province of Kauteng in mid-November had a collection of mutations that we'd never seen before. The numbers involved are quite small. There are only 71 sequences in total, so it could be a strange coincidence or some bias in the way that the samples are collected, but it's enough to raise the alarm. The next alarming thing is what these mutations actually are. Firstly, there are a lot of them, more than any previous coronavirus variant. The Delta variant, for example, which is currently dominant globally, differs from the original strain of coronavirus in just 27 places. The new variant has 61 defining mutations. The scientific term for this is yikes. It's important to note that it's not just having more mutations that makes it necessarily worse, even though you do sometimes hear that in the media. The Delta variant is definitely worse than Alpha. It's a bit better at evading the immune system, much more transmissible than that previous variant, but it actually has fewer mutations than Alpha does. And if a coronavirus had 10 times as many mutations, unless they were pretty carefully chosen, it would probably be less dangerous because changing that many things at the same time is likely to reduce rather than enhance its performance. So mutations are complicated. What's worrying about the new variant is that these mutations are in scary places. It shares mutations with the highly transmissible alpha and delta strains, and also the beta variant, which isn't as transmissible as those two, but is better at escaping vaccines. However, while we've definitely got enough evidence to be concerned about this, we won't know for sure whether this strain is actually worse until we have some more real-world data. Biology is complicated, and we just aren't good enough at it to determine a virus's behaviour purely from its RNA sequence. It could be that alpha plus delta plus beta is a deadly, fast-spreading, immune-escaping monster variant. Or it might be that these mutations cancel one another out in a strange way, meaning that it's less scary, or maybe not even scary at all. So what do we know from the real world? This is where you need to do a bit of detective work and also get a bit lucky, because the best time to catch a new variant is early, maybe in time to stop it. Unfortunately, that's also the time when only a few people are infected, making it easy to miss, and then the statistics on a small number of people are inherently uncertain or at risk of being biased. Sequencing is the only way to track a variant for sure, 
because when you do a PCR test or take a lateral flow at home, it just gives you a yay or nay. Are you infected with coronavirus? And doesn't tell you exactly which coronavirus you've got in your system. However, one small piece of good news about new is that it shares a mutation with alpha. That means we can actually spot it in PCR tests, basically by accident. And that allows us to have a better idea of how fast it's spreading. The bad news is that makes it look like it's spreading pretty fast. PCR tests look out for three sections of the coronavirus's RNA, one of which is called the S gene. And this is the part of the RNA that contains the instructions for the spike protein, which allows the coronavirus to get into our cells. Alpha and Nu are missing six letters of their S gene, and that means that the PCR for that gene is going to fail. The other two genes being tested for still work, so we can still tell people whether or not they've got COVID, but watching how many tests are positive for those other two genes but experience what's called S gene dropout allow us to watch the speed at which the variant is transmitting. And the news here isn't great. S gene dropouts in South African PCRs have gone from less than 5% to over half of tests in a matter of weeks. Again, the scientific term for that is yikes. It could be that there's some problem with the PCR tests, or maybe a different variant or a random chance is driving this, but it's certainly enough to be concerned. What about immune escape? Well, basically, we don't know. Based on the sequence, there are enough significant looking changes to be worried, and labs around the world will be rushing to do experiments on this new virus, taking antibodies and cells in a dish to see how they react to the new variant, and that will start to give us some idea. But again, what we really need are real-world data. Lab experiments can only approximate the messy complexity of the human body, the environment, and society around it. And data like these, looking at numbers of people infected who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated, or have or haven't already had the virus, will just take time to gather. What we can infer already is a bit concerning, though. Fewer than a third of South Africans have been vaccinated, but there have been an awful lot of infections. And that means, overall, there's probably quite a lot of immunity in South Africa. So, while it's a complicated picture, if the new variant is growing as fast as it seems to be, that's at least consistent with a degree of immune escape. Perhaps that's how it's getting around the community immunity in the South African population. And finally, in terms of disease severity, we're going to be waiting a while to be really sure. If, optimistically, it takes a few weeks to get good data about whether a variant's more transmissible, you then need to wait a few more weeks for those people who were transmitted to to get ill enough to need to go to hospital, or end up in intensive care, or to die. By the time you're sure whether or not a new variant is deadlier than the old one, it might well be too late to stop it. And even if it is less deadly, a variant might still be able to kill more people because it's more transmissible, simply by infecting more people, and therefore killing a fraction of them. So, for a definitive answer to these questions, all we can do is watch and wait. But if you're a politician, it's probably better to do something, because by the time we can be sure, the cat may be well and truly out of the bag. So, what are the broader lessons of the new variant? The first thing is that it's worth reiterating. Where a variant is discovered isn't always where it originated. The reason South Africa has had so many mentions so far is because they've got great COVID data infrastructure, not necessarily because that's where new started, and they've been incredibly rapid and open in sharing their early data. But South Africa is responsible for 40% of the coronavirus sequences from the whole continent of Africa, and that means it's a very likely place for enough data to be available about a new variant to begin to understand it. In fact, the variant was first spotted in a sequence from Botswana. And just to show how complicated the picture is when it comes to quality of COVID data around the world, Botswana has submitted more coronavirus sequences per capita than Spain this month. And that's why we should call diseases by their official designations, rather than the Botswana variant, or, you know, Spanish flu. It also shows us how vital it is that we help people in poorer countries get vaccinated. One reason why it's more likely that a variant might emerge, somewhere like Botswana rather than somewhere like Spain, is that over 80% of Spaniards have had two doses of a vaccine, whereas less than a quarter of Botswanans have. That means the virus has a lot more people available to infect in Botswana, and every infection is an opportunity to accrue more mutations and create a new, nastier variant. Quite apart from the obvious, direct, humanitarian imperative to prevent serious illness and death from COVID in poorer countries, there's also a global imperative to prevent the emergence of new dangerous variants of the virus that could affect us all. 
We also need to improve sequencing capacity in countries around the world, and particularly in poorer ones. Seeing a sequence you've not seen before is the first step in identifying a new variant. And poorer countries have a double whammy in this respect. They've got both the lowest vaccination rates, meaning the highest risk of a new variant emerging in the first place, and the least sequencing capacity, meaning the high risk that when one does, we won't spot it until it's too late. And both of these are part of a broader strategy of acting preemptively rather than reactively. Trying to stop variants emerging in the first place, trying to get systems in place to identify and contain them before they become unstoppable, and acting in cases like this where we have got an early warning. And how we act is also crucial. Travel restrictions on South Africa and surrounding countries have already been announced, but this is both insufficient and potentially counterproductive in the long term. It's insufficient because the variant is quite likely to get out eventually. Even countries with very effective border controls have had huge problems keeping Delta out, and a more transmissible variant will only make things harder. These restrictions buy us time, and we should use that time to provide support to the countries that raise the red flag, send them vaccines, sequencing machines, and crack teams of epidemiologists and doctors to try to control the outbreak, send financial support to help people isolate and mitigate the damage of measures like local lockdowns if those are needed to contain the spread. If the message is that raising the alarm leads to a travel ban and nothing else, then enthusiasm for raising the alarm will rapidly wane. And even purely selfishly from a rich country's perspective, it's a massive missed opportunity to stop the variants before they make it to our shores. We also mustn't forget that, new variant or not, the existing coronavirus epidemics in many countries are quite bad enough that it's worth doing something about them. And the good news is, the same precautions work against new variants as work against the old ones. No variant yet, thankfully, is completely vaccine-proof. No variant can magically penetrate the walls of your house if you work from home rather than going to the office. No variant is better at sneaking through a well-fitted medical-grade mask. No variant won't be diluted if you meet in the open air rather than inside, and so on. The world is, understandably, sick of this pandemic. Covid clearly isn't going away anytime soon, and especially now vaccines have massively reduced the risk of serious disease and death, at least in the rich world, there's a huge amount of Covid apathy and Covid exhaustion. But while vaccines may have undermined both the rationale and the enthusiasm for a huge zero-Covid-style programme of disease reduction, perhaps a global focus on vaccination, surveillance and support could at least give us zero new variants, so we can learn to live with this iteration of the virus rather than so many nasty variants that we'd run out of Greek letters to name them, and the spirit to fight them.